you back, and I know you appreciate your pastor, but he, um, he is a gift to your church. I hope you take care of him. I hope you care for him. I hope you pray for him every day. I know it takes a big team, and all of you are part of that in this church, but uh, it's a special gift to the church, your uh, senior pre preaching pastor, and I, I've learned to love him in the past few years, and I hope you're loving him well, because if you don't, God might take him away from you, and you don't want that, so... You better take care of your pastor. And what a great year for me to be back with such an esteemed panel of speakers that we have. I, I am just so um, encouraged, and, and I, yet I really wonder, with all the firepower in the front row, why I got assigned the hardest topic. <laughs> I mean, I'm not saying it's the most complex topic, but it is the hardest topic. It's the most difficult to successfully preach I can assure you, because uh, who as a Christian doesn't want to learn more about the holiness of God, right? I mean, I think every Christian wants to know more. Tell me, explain it, help me understand that. That's awesome. That's God we're talking about. And when it comes to our sanctification, what real Christian in this room doesn't at least deep down really want to grow in sanctification? And then they assign me holiness in the church, which um, I'm just telling you, man, that's not a topic anybody's going to, if you like it, there's probably a problem with you. You have a problem. <laughs> but I'm supposed to somehow get you to understand it and want to do it. That's, uh, that's going to be a challenge here tonight. Because when it comes to God, I mean, that's great. We focus on God, and it's about God, and then it's about me. i got to get this life together, walk in the Spirit, and walk in step, and obedience. But now all of a sudden, we're going to say, oh, yeah, and then all these people that you're sitting next to, people across the room, yeah, you got to start caring about their holiness. Uh, that. That isn't fun. Matter of fact, you might, it might actually bring up a verse in your mind back in Genesis chapter 4. It's really the first snide rhetorical question in the Bible. It's when God came uh, asking Cain about Abel, right? Where's your brother? And uh, Cain said, uh, what, am I my brother's keeper? That was a bad question to ask. That was, not, that was not the question you should have asked. That didn't go over well, even though I find Christians sometimes quote it as though that was a good statement. And, and when I talk about you and I caring about everyone's sanctification in this room, and I'm saying, no, 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 you should take a real concern with other people and their holiness, I mean, I think you're going to be tempted to say, but really, I, I got enough to worry about understanding God. I, I got enough of a concern just trying to be holy in my own life, fighting temptation. You want me to care about the people across the aisle right here? I, am I my brother's keeper? That would be a bad question for you to ask, really. You shouldn't be asking that. Uh, that didn't end well for Cain, and it won't go well for us. Yes, we need to learn to care about our brother and to actually come away this evening saying, yeah, I am my brother's keeper, as uncomfortable as that may be. We've got to see that as important, and I want to zero you in on one passage, really just one half of one verse that's going to help us see, and this is one of many passages we could look at in the New Testament, that this is something that we are assigned. We've got to take this on. So take, so take your Bibles and, and turn to Colossians chapter 3. We're just going to look at the first half of verse 16. Colossians chapter 3, verse number 16. And this is a hard passage, especially for individualistic American Christians, especially that one very uncomfortable word right there in the middle of the verse. Let's read it together. Verse 16, follow along as I read it for you. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. That sounds like uh, holiness in my life. That's great. But then it says, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom. Now, I'd love to preach on the last part of this, but I wouldn't assign that either, singing and singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. Those are all great, but just that phrase right there, to teach and admonish one another. This is a calling in our lives, and it's not easy. It's tough. I'd like to somehow get out of it. Admonishing. That's the word. Underline that. I bet there wasn't a coworker in your office that used that word this week. Am I right? Admonishing. Not last month, not last year. Well, most of your non-Christian friends have never even used that word, let alone understand the word, uh, and yet it's here in the New Testament for us. I guess in the ESV, about five or six times, it translates the word that shows up 11 times in the New Testament, and it certainly comes down to my responsibility to care about the holiness of my brothers and sisters, and we want to look at this tonight and sense it, that this is something that we should be concerned about, willing to act to promote it and aid that holiness in their lives. And so let's think this through carefully tonight. Look at the context, if you would. Start up at verse number 12 in Colossians chapter 3. 
Here's what we're coming off of as we, as we kind of ramp up into verse 16. It says, put on then as God's chosen ones. Of course, he's writing the Colossians. This is not, by the way, just if you're trying to squirm out of this already, it's not a pastoral epistle. It's not written to pastors, right? It's written to the whole church. And he says, okay, all of you chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, put all that on, bearing with one another. If anyone has a complaint against another, forgiving each other, just as the Lord's forgiven you, so you must also forgive. And above all this, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. All those virtues, perfect, and all these people, perfect harmony, that's great. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. I guess I want to start by just having you begin to accept the calling that you are your brother's keeper, you're, you are your sister's keeper because we are one body. And that, I mean, we see that throughout the scriptures, a great analogy of who we are in Christ in every outpost of God's church all throughout the world in geographic locations assembled under elders and deacons in the church. That is a, an outpost of the body of Christ. And we are to care for one another. It says in 1 Corinthians 12, we have mutual concern for each other. This passage is going to give us that word, that, that word to admonish one another because we see ourselves as a body and we ought to care. You are a body. You are a team. And as a team, you should care about the group performance, if I want to put it that way. I know that's a bad word these days in people's minds. But we are walking in the Spirit. We are trying to grow in personal holiness. Everything you take away from this weekend, right? All of that concern about us reflecting the holiness of God, we've got to see this is really, as God looks at this church, it is a, it's a team effort in a way. I, I taught my kids to play golf when they were very young, and that was a mistake because they got good really, really fast. And my family used to love, you know, playing together. And it was great when we would let them, you know, drop a ball in the fairway or, you know, get, get the close-up tees. And, you know, it was all cute when they were six and seven until they started beating us when they were eight and nine. And, uh, then they got really good, both became the captain of their golf teams and all of that in high school. But that was an interesting move from playing golf as a kid to joining the golf team in high school because we didn't have a very big high school. The public high school near our house wasn't that large, and so when they got on the team, uh, they recognized there were some pretty bad players on the team. Now, when they played, you know, Muni Golf Course and they ran around doing their own thing, playing golf, they just loved playing with their friends and even playing with their family so they could say, I beat everybody in my family. That was, they loved being individual players, but when they joined a team, they recognized we care about the aggregate score of the whole team. And, and now all of a sudden, they had a whole different concern about golf. Because our high school team, right, they had to beat that other high school team across town. And now they cared about everyone's bad shot. They might snicker at their dad when he duffs a shot. But when their teammate duffs a shot, no, nah, no, nah, they don't like that. And we've got to work in making sure that every team member on this team does well. Revelation chapter 2 and 3, think about that as Jesus writes these postcards to the church. We're so used to individualizing our relationship with God. Right? If we left this entire weekend and all you learned was subject one, let's talk about the holiness of God. Subject two, let's talk about your holiness. Right? If I came to you on Monday morning and said, let's see, how is everyone in your section of the church doing with that? How is your church doing with personal holiness? Oh, am I a brother's keeper? Yeah, you are. Because every single person in this church, we should be concerned about their holiness. We see that team connection. We are one body. And when one part of the body is sick, I mean, if there's a pornography problem over here, an adultery problem over here, someone embezzling money over here, someone lying to make sales at work over here, God sees all of that. He, he gives us a status report on the churches in Revelation 2 and 3, looking at the whole of that church. Even look back to the Old Testament, right? You remember that, that coming into the, the promised land and conquering Canaan. And when we had sin in the camp, God said, well, listen, I'm not moving this thing forward as, as a team until we, do we deal with this. And Achan had to be called out. And we said, we have to deal with sin in the camp. And you can put on blinders and listen to every sermon that your preacher preaches here on, from this platform and say, yeah, I'm going to learn all that. It's great. He's great giving me that information. I'm going to incorporate it in my life, and you cannot care about the people in your small group, not care about the people in your church service, but you ought to because God sees us in many ways as a corporate body. We're part of a team, and just like joining a team of golfers, every player counts. We're grateful to be included in that body. We are indeed one body. You ought to be thankful about that, but God is a God that cares about the whole team. And I need to start caring about what God cares about. And let's just take that to the next level. Go back up again in that passage when it says we are, we are, we are beloved. Verse 12, God's chosen ones, holy and beloved. That is a great, 
great reminder as to why I want to be my brother's keeper because God, I know, I love to revel in the fact God loves me. The grace of God loving me, that's awesome, but God also loves the guy across the aisle. God loves that gal in your small group. God loves that person. Think about it. If, if you have children and you walk in one, one afternoon and you say, wow, I haven't seen Johnny, right? Where's Johnny? And you say to Matthew, where's, where's Johnny? And he goes, I don't know, am I my brother's keeper? You don't want to hear that because you recognize that I would hope, if you're my son, that dad cares about my brother just as much as he cares about you. I want to make sure that I recognize that God loves the people of my church, you need to sit back and realize that just because you're showing some progress in your sanctification, if you've got some guys lagging behind that sit down the aisle, God cares about them. When Paul was being uh, uh, the coach, if you will, just before he leaves Ephesus, he gathers the pastors together and he pleads with them. Remember that scene in Acts chapter 20? And he says to them, these are great words, pay, pay careful attention to yourselves. Right? And we can think about that. If all we're going to talk about is the holiness of God and my holiness. But then he says this, and to all the flock. And now this is a pastoral exhortation. I realize that. But then he tells them why. He says, because this is the church of God which Christ has purchased or obtained with his own blood. If I start to just think about the fact that God loves my neighbor, God loves my, my disciple, God loves my small group leader, God loves the people that I walk through the doors of this church so much, I've got to say I should care about their holiness just like really I care about my own holiness. I can do more about my own holiness. I recognize that. And live a life, as it says in 1 Thess 4, that's pleasing to the Lord. And I want to please him more and more. But I want the people that God loves around me to please him more and more. I realize I can do less in their lives than I can do in mine. But I've got to think as a team and become my brother's keeper because I know God loves these people around me. Think of the faces of the folks that you rub shoulders with in, the, in, your, in this church. Think about those folks. Think about how much God loves them, that he has purchased them with his own blood. And we should love them just because they're our brothers, right? So many of the commands in Scripture, a lot of the third-person imperatives, which is interesting, we don't have really an equivalent in English to that, that we don't want to let other people fall into certain kinds of sins. Don't let other people, don't let that happen. The book of Hebrews has a great picture of that throughout the warning passages in Hebrews, that you need to see to it that no one among you Right? There's no root of bitterness that grows up. See that no one fails or falls short of the grace of God. See that no one's deceived by the deceitfulness of sins. And again, that's not a pastoral epistle. That's not an Acts 20. That's not a 1 Timothy chapter 3. This is a command for us to say, make sure no one around you is falling into sin. I know we are so adverse to this. We don't want to be the Holy Spirit in anyone else's life. I've got enough problems of my own. Who am I to start really calling anyone else out? Now, we'll get into that in a second, but let's just start by recognizing that God is not going to have you stand before him on judgment day and say, hey, listen, I don't really care what happened with the people in your small group. I don't care about the people's spiritual lives in your church. There's an accounting that we have as brothers and sisters, just like you would expect mom and dad coming home after some trip or some dinner out or date night, coming home to a house full of teenage children and saying, well, I don't really care about my, my brothers and what they did tonight. I don't care about my sisters. Of course they are obligated to care because they are family, they're a team, they're a body. So don't ever try to, in your own mind, though you might not ever say it out loud, to say, I'm not, I'm not my brother's keeper when it comes to their holiness. We are very much so, and that's where this passage is going when it gets to this one key word. We are teaching and admonishing one another. Take a look at that passage there again. Let the word of Christ richly dwell in you, teaching and admonishing one another. This Greek word that translates admonishing, that shows up 11 times in the Greek New Testament, is a compound word that throws two words together. One is the word mind, from, comes from noose, and the other one, tithemi, to, to place or to stand. Even I like to picture that as I memorized this, this Greek word years ago, something leaning against something else. Uh, Nuthateo, and some of you, if you're familiar with biblical counseling, that became a popular word to just say in, in, in Greek out there to describe a kind of biblical counseling that has a component of being very clear about setting things up in the minds of people. And in that sense, that kind of nuthateo, setting things before people's minds, really not before people mind, people's minds, but actually as I get them to think in a particular way, you can see that it sounds a lot like the process of teaching. But it's more than teaching, and clearly it's a combination here in this passage of teaching and admonishing. 
Teaching certainly is getting information across to my brothers and sisters, and we ought to always be in the process of doing that, even if we get around to singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs to one another, as we even did tonight and, and, and last night. But we need to think about this further, that it's the idea of really caring about what's going on in the minds of those around us. Uh, we need to see the mind as the battlefield, and let's just step back for a second and think about why this word has its root in the word our mind. So often, if we don't recognize that the battle for holiness is in our minds, uh, we can neglect really the real battlefield that is of concern for the brothers and sisters that we care about in our church. Um, I think back to the, the flood story when uh, God looks at the earth in Genesis 6, and he, he, I'll just read it for you. God saw the wickedness of man in the earth and every intention... Right? Their imagination, the way they frame thoughts, and the thoughts, their consideration, their thinking of their heart, which is not the center of their emotions, but the center of their, their thinking, their volition, was only, continual, was only evil continually. And it grieved the Lord. He regretted that he made man on the earth. It grieved him to his heart, made him sad, if you want to put it in those terms. But here is God saying the problem is all that's going on in their minds, their imagination, the framing of their thoughts, and all that's going on in the center of their, their reasoning, their minds. The battlefield is our minds, and as Jesus put it, it's not the things that go into our body that defile us, it's the things that come out of our heart. Again, the New Testament equivalent of that Old Testament word, leb, heart, cardia, heart in the New Testament, the idea of my, my brain, what's going on in my brain. The things that you hear about, and sadly, from time to time, we have to talk about the, the, the sin that surfaces in other people's lives. It never starts there, right? Never starts. It always starts in what's going on in the, the imagination and the framing of their thoughts in the quietness of their lives. And if I'm really going to think about my sanctification, it starts there. We're going to talk more about that this weekend. But if I'm going to really care about the holiness in this church, that means I really got to have some kind of concern. I can't con concern myself with everyone, but the circles that I run in within my church, I've got to care about what's going on in their minds. I've got to think about the things that are happening in their minds, the, influence of the influences of their mind, and I have to see that that is the battlefield that God has called me to concern myself with. I have to teach them, and I have to help shape the thoughts of their mind as a brother or sister in Christ. And to do that, he even gives us the tool in verse 16. I need to have the word of Christ, the word about Christ, the word about the gospel of Christ, the word about the instruction of Christ dwelling in me richly, and then I can have that stuff start to come out in the way I instruct and start then to nuthoteo people. I need to start to help them to think in particular ways around me. See, the battlefield is in our minds. It's in the reasoning center of our lives. And I need to have the Word of God as such a rich part of my daily life that when I'm sitting down with someone and I'm getting beyond all the pleasantries of how are you, how was your week, and really start to ask questions that I'm getting real answers to, I need to now start to say I'm really concerned with the thought processes of our heart. How can I get the Word of Christ that's so richly dwelling in my mind because I've spent time in the Word today, I've spent time in the Word this week to help you to think that same way in your mind? That really is the challenge of Christian discipleship, right? We need to care about those kinds of things that are in our hearts. There's no immorality, as Jesus puts it, no murder, no adultery, no theft, no, no lying, no slandering that's ever going to come out of the people's lives in this church that don't start with a battle in their minds. And to do that, I got to start by getting more biblical thinking in my mind or I'm never going to be a good tool. I'm never going to be a useful servant in God's hands to help other people think biblically. i got to start to think biblically. And I hope as we discuss further our sanctification, we will continually hear the refrain that the Word of God is that sanctifying work. God is wanting to sanctify His people, and He sanctifies them in the truth of God's Word. And it's an old saw, and it's a constant refrain, and it's your grandfather's kind of sermon to talk about being in the Word and being in prayer, but that is the ticket, Right? Those are the old themes that need to be revived in every generation as we fill our minds with so many other things on the internet, so many things on television. We need more of the Word. Even today, it's Saturday, you're busy. Things are going on. You had stuff going on in your family. How much of the Word did we get in our own brains? So that after this service is over and we have conversations on the patio or you go out for pie with someone when this is over and you sit there and talk about how this stuff that we've talked about tonight is affecting their lives and your lives, 
Right? How much of that word resonates from your own time in the word of God? We've got to think biblically. That means we're going to have to not be conformed to this world, but transformed by the renewing of our minds so that we might be able to be that kind of biblically thinking church that has an effect, infectious kind of transmittal of the things that God is teaching me in my mind, it's getting me to think different, to imagine different, to frame the thoughts of my mind differently, to see that become contagious in our own church. Psalm 1, of course, is a great psalm about the way we need to work hard about the things of God resonating in my own heart, meditation, that idea that's not Eastern, blanking your mind out. Really, it's just the opposite. It's about mulling in your own mind the truths and principles of God's Word. Not only what they are as principles, but how they flesh themselves out in the ways that I walk, the ways that I speak, the ways that I interact with the world in which I live. And then the whole goal is to help my brother to think that way. Now, that's a lot of talk about the reality of our responsibility and even the toolkit that I need, which is much more of the Word of God. But if you want to see examples of this, you might want to jot down 2 Samuel chapter 12 and review this at some point this weekend. Verses 1 through 4, it starts the discussion where Nathan has to sit down with David and Nuthateo him. He has to try to admonish him. He has to bring correction and, and direction to his life because now he's covered up his adultery. He's uh, tried to uh, surreptitiously have uh, Bathsheba's husband killed, which of course he was successful in. And Nathan has to come and get him to think differently. And remember how he does that? He tells a story. He tells a parable. He tries to get him to see the injustice of a man that when he has a guest goes to his neighbor who doesn't have a lot and he takes his lamb to make dinner and a feast for the, for the traveler that comes to visit him. And it, of course, it enraged David. Do you remember that? This man ought to be, uh, ought to be punished. We ought, to, we ought to do away with this guy. And he's starting very wisely and very skillfully to get David to recognize something that he's going to then turn and say, you know, that's exactly what's going on in your life. And though you may picture him with a finger leaning forward because he's Nathan the prophet, right? You are the man. But if you've ever been in those situations where you've had to try to wake up a brother or sister in Christ because of their sin, I mean, that's not how it feels, right? I mean, it's almost the tearful and, and the bent brow. You know, I think that's what you're doing right now. This is what you're going through. It's only a person who thinks biblically about the connection between the heart and the meditations and the imaginations and the framing of our reasoning in our hearts that can help someone see the thinking process in their mind and how it's leading them down a path into the deceitfulness of sin. We need to see the mind as a battlefield. We need to get more biblical thinking in our own mind, and then we need to get very skillful and prayerful when we see our brother or sister in sin and help them think biblically in, in their lives. Now, there's so much more to say on this, and we'll say more on Sunday morning, tomorrow morning. But as you just start to think, and I trust that God will in some way give you opportunity, as someone in your life you recognize clearly is out of bounds. It may not be murder and adultery, but someone you know is not doing what you recognize is clearly in Scripture what Christians ought to be doing, or they're engaged in things that Scripture clearly says they should not be engaged in, and as I said, if anyone likes this sermon, there may be something wrong with you, but you may be emboldened to say, yeah, I need to speak up. I see that there's something, there's a pattern here. There's something that just is not right. It, it clearly can be addressed from a biblical passage or a principle in Scripture. And I would just say this, be very careful when you go about that. It's not that you need to have a powwow with five other Christians before you confront or sit down a Christian and try and direct their Christian life. It's just that you really sit back carefully and think, is this something biblical or is this some kind of preference or some kind of opinion in my life? See, thinking biblically will help separate those. Uh, Romans 14 is a good passage. Before you ever sit down and try to correct someone's thinking so that you might help correct their behavior, spend a little bit of time in Romans 14 just to make sure that this is not some kind of personal preference this is a hard passage, I think, to translate, but in Romans chapter 14, verse 1, it says not to quarrel over, the ESV translates it opinions, we have other translations translated this way, disputable matters, but it's things that clearly in the passage go on to be explained, as this is not a biblical requirement. It deals with dietary restrictions of the Old Testament and, and days like the Sabbath day or the festival days, and, and, and basically, Paul says, listen, let's not... Let's not quibble over those things. Let's not, we shouldn't be confronting each other about those things. 
And he says, as a matter of fact, in verse 21 and 22, listen, you ought to, you ought to keep your own opinions to yourself, right? That's, that's the way it ought to be. I'm not out here trying to correct people to make sure they do their quiet time when I do it, make sure they have the five or six steps in, in their prayer list the way that I have mine. It's not that they ought to treat their kids in every situation the way I treat my kids. I mean, those are not the things that we ought to be helping to direct someone else. I don't want to confront or admonish anyone because of some personal opinion or preference in my life. I need to sort out my preferences from biblical concerns. Think about standing before Christ, and I think Christians don't do that enough. Standing before Christ one day, I want to make sure that I'm seeing my brother and what he is living and what he is going through and recognizing the things I really sat down and helped him see as a problem in his life weren't just cultural preferences. They weren't just things that I found to be helpful, but they were truly things that were displeasing to the Lord because the Bible has made those things crystal clear. And anytime I start talking to people about correcting other people in their Christian life, I've got to deal with motives for just a quick second. Our passage clearly is dealing with something that comes from a heart that loves the Lord and loves our brothers. We love the truth and we love the holiness that God has granted in our lives and the kind of holiness that we want to see in other people's lives. This is not about me in some way promoting myself over someone else. So often in Scripture you see that knowledge, and it can be biblical knowledge, that if it's just knowledge, what does the Bible say? It just puffs up, just makes you conceited. It's not helpful at all. But it's love that builds up. It's love that edifies. I mean, if you haven't really been grieved over the sin of someone in your small group, then let's not even start to sit down and confront them yet. It's not that you should squirrel out of that responsibility. It's just that you need to feel this from the position of someone that's saying, this is not about me coming in with a gavel and pronouncing judgment on those around me in any kind of self-promoting way. I certainly don't want to be self-deceived, and I would be remiss in talking about confronting someone if I didn't quote Matthew chapter 7, verse 3. If there's a log hanging out of your eye, which Jesus said with great hyperbole, I mean, you'd know that, you would think, right? But here's the picture. you got a, you got a telephone pole coming out of your eye, and yet you're reaching out to try and take the speck out of your brother's eye. That kind of self-deception because you have no self-awareness. Some people can learn Scripture, can hear a sermon, and all they're doing is what I call the L-shaped amen. Did I talk about that last year? Right? You love the preacher preaching that because you know the guy over here needs it, right? Amen, right? That kind of, of, of amen is quickly deflecting biblical truth and always taking notes because I know someone that needs this. Now, it may be that someone needs this, that you're going to definitely use those principles in that sermon to deal with something in their lives. But make sure all of that filters through your life in terms of application first. You look in a mirror, Right? Some people are looking in a mirror right over their shoulder at the other guy in their small group. The Word of God, James 1, is a mirror, but let it, let it reflect your image so that you can see something that needs to be corrected. All of you looked in the mirror, right? I can tell by looking at you, you're looking pretty good. You're probably looking better than you looked this morning when you woke up because you looked in the mirror, you saw your face, and you adjusted your face as best you could right? based on what you saw. The Word of God is a mirror, and it shows you, right? It holds up the the perfection of Christ, the holiness of God, and it convicts us, and it prompts us to make changes. But make sure that all the things that you're going to deal with out of someone that you love, even if it's your own adult children, even if it's your, uh, your, your physical, biological siblings, let alone your small group participants or someone that you know here in the church that you love, make sure all those things you've filtered through seeing that in your own life. Take the log out of your eye first, before you take the speck out of your brother's eye. And then lastly, I've got to say this, because I know people in our church, anytime we talk about caring about each other's holiness, they just love a good argument. They love confrontation. That's why I said if you love this, if there's something in you, there's an old word in the translations, pugnacious. There are people that are pugnacious. They just like to be in the argument. Talk about self-promotion, self-deception, but Titus chapter 3 calls it a a self-condemned person is someone who loves to stir up division. They love dissension. They love controversy. They love quarrels. And those are self-condemned people. You should know that's a warped kind of personality. So don't be the person that just likes a good argument, loves to get involved, loves to confront. No one should love to confront a brother in their sin. Be wise about this, right? Jesus passed by several people that he didn't correct. He even talked at one point about pearl before swine. He stood before his accusers, many of them at the end of his life, his earthly ministry, and didn't even answer. 
I mean, you've got to be wise and judicious. But if you say, well, great, that's a great out. I don't have to correct anyone. Uh, clearly, you have to correct. God calls us to admonish one another, to teach one another in all wisdom, thoughtfully, carefully. That's the wise part of this. Apply this sermon very wisely, very thoughtfully, very carefully with an eye to your motives. If you've ever been to the zoo, um, certainly you've stopped to watch the baboons. Am I right about that? They're a lot of fun. The monkeys, the chimps, the apes as well. If you watch them long enough, you'll inevitably see them picking and poking and prodding with one another. Have you noticed that? The zookeeper um, calls that grooming, right? I'd prefer to do my own grooming, thank you. Um, but they do it in groups. Have you noticed that? Zoologists say they do that because they're social animals. Now, we humans, and certainly Christians, like to think we're social animals. Look at our non-Christian counterparts. We're all much more social than you. We have fellowship. We love God. We love each other. But we still like to, uh, you know, brush our own hair and comb our, own te- uh, comb our hair and, and, and brush our own teeth. I, I don't want you doing that, that for me. As a matter of fact, literally, when it comes to something, you see some goober hanging out of someone's eye tomorrow morning at church. I know what most of you will do in the lobby, and that's nothing, right? But if you were a baboon, you'd reach right out and fix that problem. You'd say, I, I can fix that for you. When chimps have a problem that they spot in their fellow chimp, they, they deal with it. They spring into action. Of course, personal hygiene, let's keep things the way they are. But when it comes to ethical and moral hygiene in our church, we're going to have to deal with those things, just like you would deal with it if you love someone enough, if it's your husband or your wife, I hope, and there's a goober in their eye, you'd love them enough to take it out. And if you really love them, you'll probably pull them aside before you start picking at their eyeball. And I would say that's the kind of loving care you ought to give. As long as you're not a hypocrite, as long as you can see clearly, as long as you know this isn't a preference, this is a biblical concern. I know that I can talk and I've preached series on trying to care for the other people's holiness in your circles in the church, and you'll still have an aversion to it. You'll say, I don't want to do that. I don't want to be the Holy Spirit in anyone else's life. If the stakes are high enough and you know the stakes are high enough, I think you'll admonish and teach other people. Think about hygiene, for instance. Guys, trust me. I mean, girls may do it sooner than guys do it, but we guys certainly don't want to straighten each other's tie. But there's one point I'll see men start to groom each other. And I've been there many times, back behind the platform before we come out at a wedding, right? That's the one time I see guys straightening each other's clothing out. And that's because the stakes are high, right? This matters, this care, we care. We care about how you look right now. We're going to straighten things up right now. For their good, for God's glory, for what God wants to see in this church, uh, we ought to love each other enough to get involved when we see sin in someone else's life. That's a simple principle, but it's more than just saying you've done wrong. It's how can we help to correct the unbiblical thinking in your life? If you would love your family member enough to do that, just remember that God says our bonds here as Christians, he calls us brothers and sisters, one of the most frequent terms he uses for us in the family of God. We've got to be into care, care enough to be as it comes, as it relates to to ethics, the morals that reflect the godliness of Christ, to have the image of Christ present in this church, to give a lot more concern about what's going on in each other's lives. Of course, I would say, God first, understand the holiness of God. My sanctification, let's give top priority to that. But Then let's reach our hands and our arms out to the brothers and sisters around us and carefully, diplomatically, lovingly do what we can to make sure this church is one that if Christ were to write a postcard to us, if there's a whole new set of postcards going out, and Christ were to write about this church, he'd say, there's, there's a church that's doing well. They care for each other. They're pursuing holiness. They love enough to correct. I pray that for this church. Let's pray. God, dangerous uh, stuff to talk about correction because it can be done wrong so easily. But when we read in Scripture that the word of Christ should dwell in my life and in my heart so richly that uh, it just is a natural thing for me to teach and admonish my brother and sister, with wisdom, with all wisdom. God, we want to be wise. We just want to be wise enough to help direct my own Christian life, but 
Help us to realize because we love you, we love the people you love, and we certainly as a team realize there's a lot at stake as to whether or not this church, Founders Baptist Church, is a holy church and that these people are pursuing holiness. And who knows what you might hold back, the kind of impact and blessing that might be poured out here on this church for the good of Christ and the good of the kingdom just because we're turning the other way when someone is uh, clearly walking into the wrong, the wrong path. They're doing what clearly is grieving your spirit. So God, I know this is careful work, but let us care for one another that we might do this to your glory because we know there's a lot at stake, not only when it comes to your reputation, but that all of us one day will stand before you. So God, give us care and discernment as we proceed in trying to be a holy people, proclaiming a holy message as we serve and worship a holy God. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.